Welcome to Voices of Care, the podcast series from New Cross Healthcare that seeks to get to the heart of the issues affecting the UK health and social care sector by speaking to luminaries and leaders about how we're going to enable the healthcare workforce of the future. I'm Sahail Mirza, and we are an extraordinary inflection point for the healthcare system, including the NHS right across the UK and including Wales. And today I'm delighted to welcome Steve Moore, the Chief Executive of Hulthar University Health Board. Welcome, Steve, and thank you very much for giving us your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Steve, I wanted to get into the the question of the workforce shortages. It's been seven years since the Wellbeing of Future Generations Wales Act, a healthier Wales strategy was issued in 2018. But it's fair to say that as we see the headlines across Wales, the shortages in vacancies across health and social care are a level which is perhaps critical. Yeah, I think I've I've never known it to be quite as challenging as it is, as you say, not just in the health sector, but actually across health and social care and our domiciliary care providers. I think, however, sort of looking at this in the the broader sense, this has been something which has been building actually for many years, um, increasing shortages, probably felt much more um, uh, keenly in, in rural areas, which often had uh, uh, workforce challenges before we went into the pandemic. Because the pandemic then really, I think, exacerbated some of those problems for us. On the positive side, we saw a lot of people run towards us, run towards danger, if you like, to help uh, us to respond to the to the pandemic as it emerged. And we've managed to keep some of those people with us and to start to develop them. But I think on a negative side, of course, we've seen the huge impact this has had on our staff, um, uh, many staff uh, went through some really difficult times but, and made great personal sacrifices as well. And of course, that has a cost for people. And we're seeing people potentially leaving earlier, uh, reducing um, their time with us. Uh, and that's something which I think has really started to be felt quite keenly. And I think the other, the other issue is that it's now moving out from rural areas and we're starting to see real workforce challenges in uh, areas of Wales that maybe hadn't really been challenged with them previously. And of course, that then uh, increases our issues in places like West Wales, because then we've relied quite often on agency to fill gaps, that those agency staff are just not there because they're being drawn into these bigger areas. So there, there, there is a real sense at the moment that workforce is the key priority for the whole of the NHS. No, thank you. And, uh, you know, thank you for your candour. Digging a little deeper, there is, of course, a challenge in terms of the very nature uh, of the workforce. The uh, Healthier Wales uh, paper that came out in 2019, the draft workforce strategy, um, it painted the picture that, of course, uh, there was a significant number of people that wanted to work part-time, I think 41%, and 40% of the workforce uh, at that time uh, were aged 50 or over, which was a huge increase from a decade earlier, 2009, I think the number was about 29%. So the changing nature, the ageing nature uh, of the workforce across Wales is a fundamental challenge that has to be addressed too within the context of these broad shortages that you've talked about. Yeah, um, I, I think that's, that's absolutely um, spot on. We, we often think in the NHS about the demographic challenge that results in uh, it, uh, coming into our services, that the population is getting older. But actually what we also have, as you say, is, a, is an ageing workforce as well. And People's desire to work different patterns uh, is also, I think, uh, been really felt. These are things that actually have been um, uh, in the uh, in the ether and in some of the predictions actually for many years. I mean, it is now the 20th anniversary of the Derek Wanless report, and having reviewed it the other day, um, you can see back then we could see some of these challenges coming around our demographics. So I think that that really um, means we've got to double down on our efforts, both to grow our staffing but also to ensure that we retain as many staff as possible. And those are the sorts of areas that we're trying to focus on. I wanted to focus a lot on the actual work um, at the health board um, and looking at your strategic workforce plan. Now, you, you've issued a strategy, a Healthier Mid in West Wales, but the three-year plan uh, that you've uh, issued talks about putting people, of course, at the uh, heart of everything you do. Um, but it's also candid. It, it, I think there's a, a clear admi- uh, admission or confrontation uh, of the truth, which is that there is a risk that 30% of the workforce will retire uh, in the coming years. Um, two aspects that interests me a lot, um, learning development, which we'll come on to, but uh, the place of uh, digital uh, enablers to help the workforce uh, regenerate and uh, deliver what you need to do. Yeah, I mean, I think just just a bit of context on that. Uh, During the pandemic, at the points at which we could do so, we 
Uh, we spent a lot of time talking to our staff. We called them our discovery reports, which were really about uh, in the initial stages, seeing what people's experience was, but in the later stages to see, um, to ask real questions about how we could support our workforce better. And that's given us some thoughts that are in that three-year plan. Uh, cl clearly, as you mentioned, one of those things is around the use of digital. And of course, we've seen a huge shift um, in the take-up of digital uh, uh, facilities by our staff, by our clinicians, but also by the public. And I think uh, the pandemic, you know, if there are any bright points to it, it's probably reduced everyone's fear uh, about the use of, of, of technology, uh, whilst recognising it doesn't suit everybody. Uh, within that, within the health board, uh, actually trying to find ways of using uh, digital technology to help our staff to be able to do the things that they can only do rather than spend their time filling out forms is, is a key part of what we're trying to do to ensure that we uh, that we retain staff, that we can develop them, and that staff can look after our patients. So things like we we were the first to um, implement the Welsh Nursing Care Record. Now, I've been in the NHS for 30 years or so, um, and I've never known a digital system have such a positive impact. In fact, I had a, an anecdotal story back that when we um, uh, implemented it in our hospital in Halford West, uh, a nurse literally skipped down the corridor uh, <laughs> Uh, with joy about what it was going to be do for our working life. Those sorts of things have, you know, they have value in terms of the quality and safety of what we do, but they also have value for our staff and feeling that they can do the thing that they came to work to do. Um, that's a that's a great image to skip down the uh, corridor. Um, and obviously the consequence of these digital enablers, uh, it's not so much the question of attraction, it's actually helping clinicians, et cetera, to work at the top of their license to enhance productivity. Yeah, I think you're right. And, and productivity has got a bit of a, a bad name, I think, um, because people worry that it's all about working harder. Uh, actually, for us, it's about making sure that we, we do allow people to focus on the things that they trained to do, as you say, to work at the top of their license. And the NHS, I think, has got a long way to go uh, to uh, really invest in digital in a way that will help staff to do that, which, as you say, will benefit ultimately the productivity of what we do, how our workforce operates, but also how our patients experience the quality of care that we give them. Um, and the skills that will be needed in order to um, incorporate digital frameworks, uh, digital uh, enablers, um, goes to the heart of uh, learning and development. Now, um, the strategic plan that you have uh, makes lifelong learning a, a key plank. Um, New Cross Healthcare, uh, incidentally, has its own mission as being a, a learning partner for life uh, for uh, the social care and healthcare sector, uh, free at the point of access. So can you expand upon the learning and development pathway? Because we're seeing new roles, new models of working, uh, the existing workforce. It's a, a complex set of levers you've got to pull. Uh, but without that, uh, we're going to have different Difficulty in terms of retaining people and upskilling them for this new digital framework. Yeah, and for me, it starts uh, right at the beginning with um, supporting our local population, our local kids coming out of school, uh, to be able to get into jobs that will uh, will allow them to flourish over time. So we, we start with our apprenticeship schemes, uh, and, the, and the deal there with them um, with our uh, with those who are applying is that provided you come in with the right values, that you you demonstrate the importance of kindness, we'll develop you, we'll provide you with the educational experience, which will then allow you to, um, to get into uh, registered nursing jobs, for example, and go beyond that. So there's something for me about this being a lifelong course linked into our local population. And then, of course, for our other clinicians uh, alongside that is ensuring that we, we do have the opportunities to allow people to, uh, to develop their skills, to work with specialists. That's particularly important for medics uh, and that they have the time to do that. A part of that for us is the launch of our research development and innovation strategy, which we did this year, despite the pandemic going on, and starting to see a real, I think, renaissance in, in that work in West Wales, giving access to our patients to clinical studies, but also allowing our staff to develop uh, uh, their skills and knowledge. All of that is, is a key part of the jigsaw for us about how we retain, develop, maximise the opportunities for our staff so that ultimately we can continue to provide care in, as we said at the beginning, quite a difficult workforce environment. 
No, absolutely, thank you. And sticking with the retention point, um, you've alluded it, uh, to it earlier, um, and uh, we can't avoid the question of uh, wellness, well-being, burnout. Uh, it's been an extraordinary couple of years. I think it's going to be an extraordinary couple of years ahead. Your your well-being objectives are set out quite quite clearly: 2022, 2023, reduce uh, staff turnover, increase uh, staff workforce engagement. I, I know you've done a lot over the COVID period, but can you expand upon that? wellness, well-being, these are not nice-to-haves, these are must-haves in terms of the workforce retention challenge. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that became really clear as we as we talked to our staff and worked through the, the pandemic, you know, the amount of pressure that people were feeling uh, on the front line. One of the key things that came out of those discovery reports that I mentioned was the importance of giving people access to nature, which might sound a bit strange in a, in a beautiful rural part of Wales like we live in, but um, giving people time out in the day job to access nature, we, uh, we supported that. We set up community gardens. And actually, for those people who were most at risk of burnout, we've also established return to nature courses that we support. We give people time out of work. And we've had some really good feedback from people about how that feels. I mean, that together with some of the other things that we're, we're doing around retention, which relates to people being able to work at the top of their license and develop, as we've talked about uh, where we've now seen that Howard has gone from one in, having one of the highest um, turnover rates to one of the lowest in Wales now. So we know that it works, but actually we've got to continue to maximise all of those opportunities. Now that's a, a magnificent achievement of which you obviously are very, very proud. And just as a segue, you, you mentioned uh, the, the word kind and kindness in terms of attracting people. Um, Culture's a big word, it has a multivalent meaning, but I wanted to focus really on one aspect of that, and that's the importance of inclusion, uh, to make sure that's part of the culture that you espouse and that the board walks its talk in that regard. Yeah, and again, I think this was um, really brought to, to sharp focus by the pandemic, uh, particularly around our, our BAME staff, um, and early on in the pandemic, you know, there were many worries uh, uh, about um, the risks of the virus to those to those groups. We set up a BAME group uh, across the health board, um, which is actually just grown and grown. It's really flourished. They they sit on the board, they see all our papers, they're able to comment on them. And actually, we've seen that now really de developing roots out into the organisation. And alongside our LGBTQ plus network, which also did a lot of work in the, the pandemic, and generally. A, a, a really strong focus on uh, encouraging staff to have their voices heard uh, has, I think, really helped us to join together as an organisation. I, I, I get from outside of the organisation regular feedback now that it feels very different culturally than many other uh, NHS organisations. You always like to think it's going well internally, but it's good to get that, that sort of external verification of that. But again, it's, it's never done. It, you've got to keep um, working at this all the time and keep uh, looking at how you can do better. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted just to touch upon the national clinical framework. Obviously, that's promoting holistic pathways, a transformative landscape, community-based uh, care. That is going to require, um, as your strategy says, a regeneration of your workforce. That requires enticing people who are about to retire to remain um, and offering new pathways and new roles within, this, uh, within the health board. Yeah, we've done a we've done a lot of work actually. We've been we've been um, leading Wales on this, I think, around a a really uh, integrated workforce plan for the next ten years. Um, we started with nursing, but actually the 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 benefit of it is it allows us to think both in the medium term and in the longer term, what sort of workforce do we need, and to start to put the 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 seeds down now for that future workforce. So things like physicians associates, uh, Banford nurses. Uh, therapists, um, therapy assistants. We've seen some great work by our physiotherapy assistants, uh, for example. Um, and that, that workforce modelling recognises the fact that there are lead times to all of this, and it really clarifies for us what are the decisions we have to make today in order to have the workforce we need in three, five, ten years' time. Uh, it's still in development. We're still working through it because it's immensely complicated. 
but it's already starting to have some benefit. And as I as I mentioned, the, the rest of Wales are now looking at that to see whether they can adopt it. Um, and again, it's a shorter term uh, opportunity, I guess. Um, international recruitment has been around for a long time. Uh, it has a part to play. It's not a panacea, of course, and it's not going to be a long term strategy. But just wanted to touch upon that um, in terms of the health board and broadly in Wales, that remains uh, a policy lever. Yeah, absolutely does. And, and when, we, when we did that workforce planning, our first cut of it for nursing really spelled out for us the gaps we're going to have this year, next year and the year after in our registered nursing workforce, which then meant back in March, we, we agreed that the only way to fill that in the short term was for a significant campaign for overseas nurses. We've now brought in, I think by the end of this year, this financial year, we would have brought in about 101 um, uh, nurses from overseas. You shouldn't underestimate the the complexity of doing that, making sure you support people as they come in. Uh, we set up um, uh, dedicated areas to help them with their OSCE training, so uh, um, real simulations. And we, we've really seen benefit from that in that they are getting through those, those, um, those qualifications quite quickly now. And we've got boots on the ground in our wards today as a result of the decision we took in March. We see that, as you say, it's not the long-term answer. We think our long-term answer is to grow our own from our own population. But our overseas recruits provide an invaluable service, and I hope they stay with us for many, many years. You mentioned growing your own. If we can just broaden the discussion, uh, clearly workforce is a huge, huge issue, uh, vacancies, the delivery of care. But if we're turning the dial um, properly in terms of health outcomes, there are many determinants uh, of that. Um, the health board is a is a major uh, employer. Your population locally is, I think, set to increase to something like uh, ten thousand shy of four hundred thousand in a, in a couple of years. Uh, you've got quite a young population. Uh, one in five people, I think, twenty two percent are children or young people. A third of them living uh, in poverty. Wanted to get your views with uh, thirty years experience in the uh, NHS. The anchor role. Uh, of uh, the board in terms of an employer, in terms of a facilitator, in terms of uh, offering hope and opportunity uh, to the population, not just in patient care, but in uh, career pathways. Yeah, and that for us is a is a huge uh, challenge and a huge opportunity. So I mentioned our apprenticeship scheme. One of the factors we have locally is that um, for our local children, particularly, as you say, many in uh, in more impoverished situations, uh, they quite often get into jobs straight from school, and then it becomes very difficult to uproot to uh, to move to, a, a, say, a school of nursing in Swansea or in Cardiff uh, in order to be able to increase their qualifications. So the whole ethos of our uh, apprenticeship scheme, and actually we've widened it now to a whole range of, of um, careers, is to take um, local children, local kids out of school based on their values, based on their ability to be kind, uh, and then to train them uh, uh, in in healthcare and to get them to the point where they will be a registered nurse. We put out an advert for 60 uh, in the middle of the pandemic and we had 600 applications, which I think really shows um, the desire for this. It's got a huge number of advantages for us. So these are local people who will stay local. Of course, we're a bilingual country. So actually we are also um, uh, uh, have people now with, with Welsh language skills, Welsh language as their first language. We've also, on top of that, we've, uh, I'm delighted to say we opened the new School of Nursing in Aberystwyth recently. So a really positive move by Welsh Government and Health Education Improvement Wales alongside Aberystwyth University to set that up. And I met some of the first students and they are people from our rural community, people who never thought they'd have an opportunity to go through formal nurse training who are now doing that. And for mid Wales, I think that will really bear fruit uh, in coming years. And then finally, we've got um, within our strategy uh, uh, the desire to build a new hospital. And we see that as a massive opportunity uh, to benefit our local population. So we're already talking to um, employers, to trainers about uh, how we can train the plasterers and the electricians and the plumbers to help us build and then main, maintain it. And it's, it's creating quite a lot of excitement. There, there's talk about an a, a academy uh, for those skills in West Wales. Uh, and then finally, if I, because uh, there's so much going on in this area, we've also looked at our procurement uh, and we're doing two things there. One is we've, we've now included alongside quality and price, a social value score within that, so that whoever's bidding for our, um, our contracts needs to demonstrate how they can create local social value from that, whether they're a local provider or not. 
And we are also, we, we, through our research and innovation work, uh, we've set up something called TriTech, which has won a number of awards, which is essentially our clinical engineering department, working with local businesses who want to develop technologies for health uh, and enabling them to, to test it in the real world, to develop their product. And that will create jobs and employment, as well as import and export opportunities for our local businesses. So very early days, I think, in all of this, but we see this as part of our long-term future for how we realise the, um, the vision that was set out in that strategy. So it's really, uh, as you say, and that's a breathtaking vision from the technology from TriTech to uh, local uh, uh, nursing uh, colleges and universities. Um, and it's really, I guess, to drive the idea of expanding the workforce, not just simply um, working within a finite workforce where health boards and trusts in England uh, compete with each other for, for workforce. It's taking a proper systems approach, which, which seems to be the uh, in the zeitgeist uh, of uh, policy initiatives. Yeah, I think you're right. And of course, we're also doing it with um, local authorities, given some of the challenges I mentioned around particularly domiciliary care. So we, we have just this uh, last month, employed our first um, 12 uh, apprentices, joint apprentices between us and Pembrokeshire Council to work between health and social care. That's the first in Wales, uh, to my knowledge, that's, that's done that. And again, we want to see that grow so that we can grow a workforce who can make choices about where in the health and care system they want to work in the future. Uh, perhaps as a lesson for England as it's uh, adjust to its new statutory framework with ICSs. Uh, Steve, as ever, it's uh, brilliant to, to speak with you. Thank you for taking uh, your time and sharing your wisdom here remotely all the way from Wales and uh, I, we hope uh, to come back and speak with you again in the future. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. If you've enjoyed this episode of Voices of Care, please follow, like or subscribe wherever you receive your podcasts. And if you want more information about how we are enabling the healthcare workforce of the future, please visit newcrosshealthcare.com forward slash Voices of Care. In the meantime, I'm Sahel Mirza. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye.